Okay, that's great. Um, I'm so sorry, those who have spoken to me before, you might find that I sound slightly strange, but that's because um, a lot of members of our team came down with COVID. Um, so actually, actually we are, uh, <laughs> well, Sucha and I are homebound because we are, we have been tested positive for COVID. Oh, no, I hope we recover so, soon, yeah. Nevertheless, um, I do apologize if the presentation is interspersed with some coughs. Um, let me start off. Um, thank you all today for taking the time to attend this um, practice group meeting. Uh, I think I'm really glad to be part of this community where we can share the knowledge that we have, particularly in this, uh, this space where I think developments are extremely fast paced. And uh, to be honest, regulators maybe um, around the world are constantly playing catch up. Today, what I'll be covering is uh, two buzzwords right, of 2021. We have heard of NFTs. The other thing is also metaverse. Uh, we'll probably just take some time to unpack these two words before addressing some of the um, legal issues and challenges that have arisen. Let me just... Ah, so sorry. Can you hear me better, Joe? Joe, can you hear uh, Jacqueline? No? Can Just you? now I did, but before I was having difficulty. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, I'll try and speak louder. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what is the metaverse, right? Um, the metaverse, it's, I think at, at the um, outset, it is a work in progress. So there's no single uh, authoritative definition of the metaverse. But what is being envisioned as is like a multi-layered virtual reality world where people will be able to spend time and also money. And some people also dub it as the next iteration of the internet. Some notable developments around the globe. I think that um, while, while it's a work in progress, I think there has been quite notable steps taken by tech giants around the world um, towards the development of this metaverse. So in China, um, tech, that tech giant Baidu launched a virtual reality app called Serang, which allows you to create a digital character and interact with other users. Of course, the founder has said that it takes about six years to fully develop um, in this metaverse world. Clearly, it's a step in that, uh, in that space. Facebook itself also has renamed itself Meta. Microsoft announced that it will acquire, uh, it will acquire a gaming company, um, Activision Blizzard, where it's a building block for its own metaverse plans. So there's all this hype, but really, what is it, right? So um, I found that this explanation by Joe, uh, Joe Radoff of the what constitutes the metaverse be extremely helpful. So I'll just take some time to run through this. So when we look at what the metaverse is, um, we can split it into, uh, John Redock has suggested that it can be split into layers, uh, namely seven layers. I think the first layer is the experience layer. And that really is the layer that a lot of people are focused on at this point in time. Um, the main, of course, the, the, the main thing is gaming, um, and you look at NFTs, all these are more content driven. You look at esports. Um, the second layer is, is called the discovery layer. And this is, this is um, in a sense, how, how, um, how experience are, experiences are being pushed to the users. So the tech behind that, um, perhaps what could be uh, uh, an analogy to be drawn is, say, for example, search engines or app stores that push certain apps to, to, to users. Um, the next layer, of course, is the creator economy. So various things that help to create the experiences. So how an, an analogy to draw that to is, for example, um, YouTube's uh, video editing softwares to help people edit and export their video content. And then after that, you have um, certain technologies such as AR, VR to develop the metaverse. So that blends the physical and virtual spaces together. And the last three layers, you are really looking at more infrastructural layers where um, you talk about decentralization, which blockchain is 
plays a very big part of. Talk about human interfaces, how does the physical body interact with the digital world? And that relates to certain um, wearables that you can use like VR headsets, lenses, smart glasses and whatnot. And the last layer being the, in, the, the true infrastructure tech and network components. So this has really helped me understand um, what this big word metaverse could possibly mean and how many um, components are involved in developing it. Do feel free to just um, stop me if you have any questions or so. <clears throat> I next go into um, NFTs. NFTs are short for non-fungible tokens. So what it what is um, non-fungible, I guess we all lawyers understand it more or less means that it's unique. Um, it cannot replace with some it cannot be replaced with something else. For example, a, a Bitcoin would be fungible. If I trade one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin, it's the same thing. But if I trade one F NFT for another NFT, it is not the same thing. So it, it can, it's a digital, what's quite important about it is that it's a digital collectible, it has a code and it can, it's represented um, by a code on a, de a decentralized digital ledger. <clears throat> what is the link between the NFTs and the metaverse? NFT is basically a tool that can be used to represent digital assets in, in virtual worlds going forward. And um, in the recent, in the past year, um, NFTs have shown itself to be um, uh, useful in quite many areas. The first, of course, being art, right? So I'll just run through some of the use cases for NFTs, um, which actually for me, this is quite, this is the exciting part <laughs> because it's all very interesting and new. Uh, so this is the bot eight yacht club collection of non-fungible tokens. Um, basically, uh, this set of cartoon apes uh, now cost really a lot of money. <laughs> and um, people are starting to see NFTs. And this is not, also not just art, but um, part of creating a digital identity, which I will briefly touch on later. So you buy an NFT that um, uh, has this uh, uh, that has this image of an ape and it's unique. So yes, we're also seeing, we're also seeing artists moving towards um, creating art NFTs. Some of these art pieces are sold by Asian, um, Asian young artists. And you also see um, significant moments in history um, becoming made into NFTs, right? So this is actually the world's first um, SMS in the, in the phone. It's quite interesting. Oh, this is taken from the local newspaper here in Singapore. <laughs> there's also, um, quite interestingly, um, there's, uh, in Seattle, there's an NFT museum, which is the world's first permanent NFT museum, uh, where they showcase digital art. And in Singapore itself, um, we had also our first large-scale NFT exhibition held last year in November. But NFT can, it has also been used in the music scene, right? So, <clears throat> um, so more recently, YouTube has said that it would be exploring um, NFT features to help its creators tap into this um, craze, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Sports assets are also going digital. So for those who are basketball fans, the top shot, which is top shot, which is the NFT marketplace for fans to buy, buy and sell and trade um, digital basketball moments. It's quite interesting because I, I suppose the analogy drawn to previous, uh, to maybe um, the past would be like, say, collectible baseball cards, but all these are now becoming digital. So they're digitalizing sports collectibles, um, uh, which is really shaking up the sports scene. Not just that, I think also fashion, but this is something that I can't really, can't really grasp personally. 
but basically you can buy um, digital clothes and um, you can basically uh, send a picture of yourself and deck yourself out in a digital outfit that you have purchased. This is really quite mind blowing. I, I, I can't wrap my head around it. And personally, I can't see myself buying digital clothes. But really, I think all this is like building a digital identity. It's quite interesting. Oh, I, I should say, um, when I was young, my mom did buy me these like cutout dolls. So when I saw the how you deck yourself out in your digital outfits, it really reminded me of um, these cutout dolls. <laughs> um, but, but Quite interestingly, um, luxury, luxury fashion houses are jumping onto the bandwagon. So Gucci made more than US, US 4K on the digital bag. If any of this interests you, uh, um, please feel free to um, engage in the discussion with me as I go along. The other thing is um, there's virtual land as well, right? Um, the, because the metaverse is a virtual world, um, there's, there's the idea that you can buy virtual land. Um, and this, because of the hype of the metaverse, um, uh, people are jumping on the bandwagon and wanting to get a piece of the digital property market. So uh, this is quite interesting. Um, Sandbox is one of the, the virtual world websites. Um, Decentraland as well, I think. So just now I mentioned um, NFTs have become, can be used as some form of a digital identity through certain avatars. So what you had seen earlier, the bot apes, and we see the crypto punks and the Fanta bears, um, where they are seen in the crypto as some form of an identity. And if you own one of um, these popular um, avatars, it, it ascribes a sort of a, a status to you in the digital world. Uh, NFTs has, have also been used as a means for membership access. So quite interestingly, um, the Fly Fish Club, which is actually a private dining club, um, they were selling these NFTs um, as a means to gain access to the dining club, which is very exciting, I think. And um, for those of you who are into music, uh, NFTs are being used for events and ticketing as well. So Coachella recently launched uh, lifetime access keys to their to their concerts and these are going for uh, uh, quite a bit of money. Right. So the big question, right, is this really, is this all a bubble? Um, I think that definitely um, there's, there are quite a lot of platforms that showcase NFTs and they don't require verification of authenticity from the sellers. I think this has resulted in a lot of potential for fraud and when you trade and uh, buy NFTs, you, 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 you are trading on a caveat emptor basis. And NFTs also have no intrinsic fundamentals to evaluate, like it's not like shares, right? Sometimes as for, for NFTs, a lot of it is market sentiment and hype, which drive up, drive up its valuation. Um, of course, we've heard of instances where um, people are buying uh, NFTs that really have no value, objective value, for example, uh, the Indonesian, the Indonesian chap who sold a selfie of himself, uh, or um, someone selling a blank piece of white, blank white square as an NFT. So, um, most of the NFTs are, are, are liquid, illiquid, and um, pretty volatile. But that's it. Um, that's it. I think that um, many of the NFT projects, which um, have value will survive and the ecosystem around the NFT, um, i.e. the metaverse, building of the metaverse, it will grow. So it's not a space that um, we can um, just ignore and we do need to keep a lookout for it. <coughs> so sorry. So with NFTs, I think um, one of the legal issues that arises, what, what exactly do you own, right? 
um, you own the, the, the token itself, the non-fungible token itself, but what about the underlying asset? For example, if it's a piece of art, a digital art, or if it's music, do you own the copy of it? Um, there is a divide between the NFT and the underlying asset. The ownership of the NFT does not necessarily mean you have ownership rights in the underlying asset itself. So ultimately, it depends on uh, what are the, what's the contract between the buyer and the seller in the transfer of certain rights and obligations in the underlying asset. So this is quite clear in <coughs> when we apply intellectual property laws. Uh, just an example, if you're uh, not sure if you're familiar with crypto kitties, it's a pretty cute cat. So you can buy cute cats. But when you buy these crypto kitties, it only permits you to um, commercialize the kitty, provided that your commercial use doesn't result in earnings of more than US 100,000 per year. So there are, there are sort of uh, um, limitations to the rights that you are granted. The NBA Top Shot uh, grants the owner a moment, a uh, historical moment in the basketball world. Um, license to use, copy, and display that moment, but it doesn't allow you to commercialize it. So IP rights must be expressly assigned in a smart contract or written contract. Ultimately, we are still applying um, the laws that we are familiar with um, in this new space. And we talk about like financial regulation of, of NFTs. Um, and at this point in time, I just want to say that these are, these, this is my understanding of some of the laws in other, other jurisdictions. And if you are from that particular jurisdiction, um, if my understanding is not so correct, please do let me know. Uh, in Singapore, um, at least at this point in time, given the non-fungible nature of the NFT, um, there are no regulations uh, governing it. Um, our Payment Services Act only seeks to regulate digital payment tokens, so i.e. like your crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. And if your NFT is not a security, our Securities and Futures Act doesn't govern it as well. In the EU under the My, My Car regulation, it seems that the, the general view is that it's not intended to apply to NFTs, but um, seems that the definition is also quite broad and could possibly apply. Um, so there's a little bit of uncertainty there as well. And then there's this thing that arose if you fractionalize an NFT. So for example, if you imagine um, the NFT being like a company per se, just a very bad analogy, but breaking that up into say a hundred shares. Um, the US SEC has come out to say that issuing such NFTs, fractional NFTs may be considered as investment contracts under US securities laws. And the other thing is some um, certain, I think all this, um, uh, as when I highlighted the, the, the high risk of fraud um, or, or misconduct and, and anti-money laundering concerns that may arise when dealing with NFTs as well. I think we may be looking at possible regulation moving forward. Um, like as with our, as with the digital payment tokens, it could be that the regulators may look at um, regulating or imposing um, um, rules on platforms that uh, are marketplaces for NFTs. That could be one way forward. The other issues that, uh, issue that comes up is um, taxation of NFTs. Uh, so in Singapore, I must say that it's unclear. Mm. Sorry. <coughs> It's unclear. The, 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 the tax authorities here have said that the sale of NFTs can possibly attract goods and services tax. But it's in respect of income tax, um, the guides that have been issued thus far only deal with um, utility tokens, payment tokens, and security tokens, but they don't deal with non-fungible tokens like that. Presumably, if your NFT does not fall into any of these three classes, then um, it's not clear what the, 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 the tax authorities' treatment of this would be. Uh, in the US, I, I, I was reading up on this, and it seems that the prevailing top 
is that some NFTs may be considered as collectibles and therefore um, income from trading such NFTs may be subject to tax. I'm happy to hear the, 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 the folks on this call um, from US on, on what your thoughts are on this. Quite interestingly, in South Korea, um, there, I think there's a little bit of back and forth. At first, they said that they wouldn't be taxing NFTs, and now it seems that they have gone the other direction um, towards wanting to tax uh, income from trading NFTs. Hey Jacqueline, the the uh, yes. the U.S. the U.S. income tax treatment of this these back yes. with when when bitcoins came out, I think they're following mm -hmm. the same pattern. They're just saying this is a tradable asset. This is an asset. And there's certain currently, I think the IRS is really doubling down on crypto uh, reporting, and they'll probably bring these mm -hmm. in too, I suspect. Anyway, you asked, mm -hmm. I thought I'd jump in. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks. Yeah, that you clarifies things. Yeah, that <clears throat> it's, I think what is wonderful about this practice uh, group is that we can bring to the table. Um, our understanding of our domestic laws and and really I think that the regulators are also probably having to learn from each other and likewise we can. <clears throat> mm. I, I now move away from NFTs and um, just want to go into the metaverse. Um, I thought that this diagram might be a little bit helpful in understanding how laws can apply to the metaverse. Um, the metaverse being imagined as a, a virtual reality world. I, I read this, I came across this article, which um, I'll be very happy to share with um, you all um, in presenting this framework on how we can understand the four layers of rules or laws that can apply. Oh, so, sorry. So taking that green circle as the virtual reality world, um, one set of rules can, that can apply is rules that are already, uh, rules that are within the world itself, um, regulating how you act. For example, drawing the analogy to those who game and play like Grand Theft Auto. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that you kind of drive around um, and sometimes if you break, if you break rules, um, the virtual policemen will come after you. So within the world itself, there are, there are laws that ap apply. And if you move to the outer boundary of that virtual reality world, um, then laws that limit what you can or cannot do. Like for example, if you're to play Mario Kart and you try and drive off, um, or drive off the track, you will always be brought back onto the track again. So kind of like in our real world, the laws of physics, um, things that prevent us from doing certain things, like we can't fly, um, yeah, we can't fly on our own accord, etc. And then there are laws that govern um, our use of the world. So applying that to say um, the analogy of us using a particular software, um, or using particular site, right? There are like our terms of use or the um, end user license agreements. So these are laws that govern our use of that, um, of that particular world. And lastly, um, what you see at number four, regular laws that continue to apply. So um, if we take the internet as, as um, a, a sort of a virtual uh, world, then rules like um, protection from harassment, the Protection from Harassment Act, defamation laws still continue to apply to people who use this world. So you can still be found liable um, for whatever you do in the online world. <coughs> so this help me, helps me understand um, the framework within which uh, laws may apply in in this new metaverse and where perhaps uh, um, the regulators may step in and where you know, our role as lawyers can be. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, okay. So the, basically the four layers that I explained uh, is law in the simulation, that's the very first one, 
then the law of the simulation, law governing the simulation, and law of the location. Pretty like, this is pretty, um, quite an interesting article. Um, but before I go there, I just, um, <clears throat> just want to perhaps highlight that uh, I, I guess there could be, with, with all sorts of new things, there's always um, a sense of regulators playing catch up, but there are also um, real world laws that can continue to apply. I guess that's what I have learned from my experience in first dealing with uh, um, the, the initial coin offerings at the start. So dealing with the tokens right at the start before even our Payment Services Act had come in, trying to apply our the existing laws to um, the, new, the new subject that has appeared. Um, so what does this mean for all of us, right? I think that, that it's exciting because uh, and there are quite a few areas of new areas of work that have come up because of all the developments in this space. So quite earlier on, we saw um, a lot of uh, uh, having to um, prepare legal opinions on the regulation of some of, of tokens, token sales and fundraising, advising on that. Of course, um, said buying and selling digital tokens, terms and conditions, and some, it could be token escrow and custody arrangements that we can advise on as well. And then in terms of the metaverse, the legal and regulatory structuring, that's one area. Um, private sale agreements, just some of the things that we can, we can um, advise the clients when they come to us. Ah, okay. Um, before I come to the end um, of this, that's really a, just quite, pretty much an overview of um, Metaverse, NFT, and I, I thought that just breaking it down and um, uh, for those of us who are not so familiar with this space, so that's not so um, frightening, it's not, it's not that scary, and um, we can always uh, work on this area. Um, and with that, I just wanted to share that um, for my team and I, um, we started doing work in this space about, about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and it has just, uh, <clears throat> sorry, one of the first pieces of work that we had undertaken was reviewing tokens to be listed on an exchange. And it was all very new, you know, when you look first look at the white papers. And those of you who are in the space, um, happy to, for, for us to also share our experiences. But when I first read a white paper of a token, and I was like, I'm not sure what was going on. <laughs> but ultimately, um, it was a matter of um, it was a matter of addressing the issue of whether this token would be regulated by the existing laws that are in place, and that entailed as um, looking at the rights that are attached to the token, what is being purported to be uh, given, um, and um, uh, and, and that necessarily, once we understand the rights, then we can apply the laws that we know to the, to, to, to the specific facts. So for those, of course, in the common law jurisdiction, it, it's something that we are familiar with. And when the Payment Services Act in Singapore was enacted, um, that also led to a lot of new work for us because people are coming to us wanting, to, um, uh, help, uh, wanting us to help them with their applications for the Payment Services License. And we have also done, then gone on to do um, work for clients who wanted to pivot their business into, um, into this space. So moving from, for example, moving from real estate um, into, into um, crypto mining, for example. So dealing with crypto mm -hmm. mining agreements, <clears throat> which at the end of the day, actually it's applying contractual principles that we are familiar with um, and uh, establishing um, metaverse projects. So at the end of the day, it's also dealing with partnership agreements, for example. So there are a lot of um, legal principle, simple principles that we are familiar with that we're just applying to the new area of law. Um, I, I must admit that at some point, at some points in time, it is fairly intimidating and, and scary because you, of course, we, it, we haven't come across this in law school, right? It's not taught to us. But 
<clears throat> at the same time, um, knowing that because it's new, um, all of us, whether or not we are junior or senior, we also kind of start off on the same footing. Um, and having a team to really just uh, um, trudge through this together and to learn as much as we can together, um, that was necessary. And more importantly, going back to the basic principles um, of uh, just simply uh, thinking of basic principles, you know the law, you have to understand the facts and you try to apply the laws to the facts. But of course, with new practice areas, there's always regulatory uncertainty. And that to cover that, that necessitates um, keeping updated with news, um, whether, it's not, whether or not locally, um, internationally, I think, but because uh, this particular space is, is very borderless, there's a need to um, always keep an eye out on what are the international developments. <clears throat> 